<laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad to see people uh, enjoying the Connections Cafe. Um, we are going to now um, uh, go further into HMMs. I just want to recap what we've said so far to make sure it, it sticks in. So hidden Markov models describe situations where we have an underlying set of possible situations we could be in that are small and countable in number typically. So they're, they're, they're always countable in number. So um, we may have an outbreak, a non-outbreak state, or we may have a, um, a situation where we're sitting, standing, lying down, or engaged in more vigorous activity, or off have the phone off person. <clears throat> there's an evolution in that underlying state that's positive. We know it's not always the same, but we don't have perfect information on that. And we're interested in being able to deduce that underlying state from observations that are themselves very ambiguous. Maybe there's one type of observation, maybe there's many types, but from the observation alone, in isolation, it's not enough to to, to tell us directly what's going on. Or if it is, it's, it's only very sparse. So we have you know, only the occasional check of someone's hypertension level. And between those, we don't know what the situation is normally, and we want to infer it. Here, the underlying situation, the latent situation, is not directly observable. But the evidence that we do have in the form of data is very ambiguous. But we recognize there are some underlying regularities about how, how things change, the rate at which things change, which would suggest, for example, if someone had, is, is uh, engaged in some behavior, we want to know are they driving or not. And there's a measurement, say, based on GPS speed for this little bit of time that's quite low. Maybe it's, you know, that they're on average moving at, at one meter a second during this 15 second interval. We can't rush off and say, okay, they're not driving now. You know, it's, it's such a low rate of speed. But if we know in the last, for the last 10 observations before this, they've all been at high rates of speed. That would lead us to suggest it's quite plausible that the person now is still driving. It's just, you know, this is an unusual measurement given driving behavior. Maybe they're at the stoplight, right? Maybe they're stuck behind a bus that's dropping people off and, and they'll start driving again. Anyone reading here about their GPS speed is uncertain in terms of telling whether they're driving or not. It's quite ambiguous. Even a measurement of a high rate of speed on GPS if you're not driving, is possible uh, because of satellite inaccuracies. But knitting together observation from other time points in light of the fact that the situation is changing at, at certain rates in the underlying situation we posit to be changing will often constrain our interpretation. So we'll accommodate the fact that, for example, there may be a whole sequence of high high velocity measurements from GPS, which, which uh, would be consistent with driving, and then one or two mixed in with them that, are, that suggest a low rate of speed. Probably they were driving the entire period. It's just that they were at stoplights for certain periods, et cetera, and it led to low rates of speed. Rather than rushing off and assuming they were driving, not driving, driving, not driving, and, and sort of very quick succession. And so it is with a lot of these underlying situations. We know there are some underlying regularities. We may not be able to pin down exactly how frequent they are. Um, and we may want to deduce that. But they constrain our interpretation. So with HMMs, we're often knitting together evidence, not just from one type of observation, but multiple types, and combining evidence from one period of time with evidence from multiple periods of time into a consistent, plausible picture for what's going on. Now, there was a question which came, and I'm, I'm grateful uh, to one of our TAs, Narges, for, for bringing it up, about what's the relationship 
between the structures that we're saying. So you'll notice in some of my diagrams I have question marks here. And some of my diagrams and, and talk about, you know, we have, we're uncertain about this. We, we, we have these depictions of probabilities and we want to know what's going on here. And other diagrams I've filled in values here, which actually say, okay, we're going from on person to off person with a certain certain probability per minute, and we're interested in knowing what the situation is here. And you may be wondering, so do we know these values, or do we not know these values? Um, you may think I've talked out of two sides of my mouth. That in the one time I'm, I'm, I'm talking about situations where we we posit this is going on with particular values, and and we're deducing what's going on at a certain moment. And then at other times I'm talking about deducing those. Well, the reason for some of the confusion is there's several different ways in which you use these models. And sometimes it's useful to explain them in a certain way. Okay, So when we apply hidden Markov models, like many other types of machine learning models, we broadly distinguish two types of ways of applying these models. We distinguish what's called supervised learning. That's the learning is the machine learning moment of it. Where we know a lot more about the uh, underlying situation for one particular circumstance or for a small number of circumstances. We use that to train a model. Versus what's called unsupervised learning. Where we don't have any privileged knowledge of a particular circumstance and we're trying to infer a model structure that's most plausible given, given the fact that we know limited amount, um, we, we really don't know any, anything in detail about particular circumstances. So I'm going to describe these and you'll see how they factor in to the, um, to the models here. I'm just going to close this door a little bit. Okay, so with supervised learning, the idea here is we, there are times where we apply hidden markup models, like other machine learning models, where for a certain, a certain circumstance, we actually know the underlying situation. We have what's called ground truth data. Sometimes we talk about it as being labeled data. So you could imagine, for example, um, having an observer observe someone in terms of um, when they're sitting, standing, lying down, taking records of it. And meanwhile, that person who they're observing is carrying a phone. And it's recording their accelerometry, gyroscope values, etc. And we have a record for a couple hours, say, when they're sitting, standing, lying down, when it's off person, when they're engaged in vigorous physical activity. We know when each of those is the case. And we have observations for that. For that one person, or maybe for a small segment of people, um, or maybe we have uh, a small group of individuals, let's say 10 people, who are asked to very carefully record using a tool like Ethica. When I start driving, I'm about to start driving, I say I'm about to start driving, and then when I stop driving, I say I'm stopping driving. And so we know there are intervals of driving. And we have a full record of the GPS readings from throughout the day, and we relate that to the periods of the driving where it's the ground truth situation is known. So we might have specialized studies that for a small number of samples, we know the true situation and that we're trying to infer normally, and we have the observations as well. Um, and in this case, for HMM, we can actually deduce directly from the label data, from the observed data, we can actually deduce these characteristics of the HMM. We can deduce these distributions. We can deduce these transition probabilities. We can look over the course of 20 days for a given person, how often were they switching from driving to non-driving and vice versa. Or we could look for, I'm observing someone as to whether they're sitting, standing, lying down, the phone is off person, or, or they're engaged in more active uh, behavior. I follow that person around, and I can, 
I could actually compute how frequently, if they're sitting, do they go from that to standing? How frequently do they go from that to the phone being off person? Hmm? I can deduce these things from the data. I can deduce those transitions. In that case, I can directly estimate these transition rates. I can directly estimate, for a given state, say they're driving, from looking at the data that was collected when I know they were driving, I can estimate the probability of observing certain GPS speeds from that. And I know, oh, well, a certain, you know, 5% of the time when they're driving, they have a GPS speed between 0 and 5 kilometers per hour. I could create a distribution representing when they're driving, this is the set of GPS, this is the distribution of GPS speeds. When they're not driving, these are the set of GPS speeds. And that's all I need for my model right there. Um, those are the key things needed for my model. That's from what's called supervised learning. In other words, we have this privileged data, but we don't have it for everyone. That's the key thing. We only have it for a few people. So the idea is, well, we, we deduce the structure of the ABM for those, and then that ABM whose structure we deduce, we apply, apply it to lots of other examples. We posit, well, that ABM should hold for other people as well, and we will apply it to other circumstances. And you, you can see some issues that might come in there. Maybe my driving behavior is quite different from someone else's, especially because I'm a year-round biker here. Um, <laughs> and so it might not be representative. Um, this is one of the challenges that comes into to supervise learn. Um, but the idea here is we do have recourse to ground truth data, label data, and we use it to directly deduce uh, an HMM. And from that HMM, we can, then, we can then use that HMM to infer what's going on for other people at different times given their data where we don't know their underlying situation. That's one way of using AVMs. It's called supervised learning. We train them on a, a privileged subset of data where we know the true underlying situation. And then we go and and we apply them to a much broader set of data where we don't know the underlying situation and we try to deduce it. Very powerful. We did that, in fact, with the sitting, standing, off person and lying down um, uh, active situation. Um, so we had a bunch of volunteers, um, I will share that I was amongst them, who, who diarized what we were doing. And I was extraordinarily careful in and, and recording every time I stood up or sat down or, or lay down or put the phone off person. I was exquisitely careful to note that. And we have fine quality data. I will further note that not all participants were as careful. <laughs> yes? So we, we did that with um, our Excel rounder yeah. data. With we, we were trying to trying to see whether or not lobstermen are wearing black jackets. So uh, so we put accelerometers on the black jackets. And then we, just to, to be able to determine whether, because they're doing lots of different things on a boat, we, we had, we went out and we videotaped them wearing the life jackets with accelerometers on. And then sometimes we take it off and put it on the deck or various things. So we have all the different I guess on off, not worn, worn yep. type states. And then uh, we took the video and we uh, had coders go in and tag, you know, whenever there was a change in the state. Yep. So that's very similar. Yes. I mean, that's exactly what you're talking about, that, you know, that's right. that ground truth data. And then, so we're going to take that and test, test what we have. We, we have four votes that we're going to use as our training set, yep. and then we're going to validate it against the three votes. Or Precisely. Right? And, and that's a, and, and you can engage in this cross validation where you actually use different subsets of the data to train and test, where you're training it and test, you're training it on data where you know the true underlying situation, you're testing it on the data where you also know the true underlying right. situation because. You want to evaluate it, you know, rigorously. Does it predict the true underlying situation? Yeah. 
And that's a classic use of, of um, this sort of supervised or, uh, machine learning. Supervised in the sense that we've, we've gone through the trouble of labeling it all, of, of ground truthing it. And uh, it's not without its challenges, it's not without its shortcomings, but it's a very powerful mechanism uh, that you can use to um, to arrive at uh, a uh, rigorously evaluated model. Um, you don't want to just train it on all data where you've labeled it, because then you it's hard to evaluate how much does it hold for for you know how much does deducing it from this subset hold for that one. So that's why you do that cross validation. You you train it on some, you test it on others, and you kind of do that in a rotating way. Where I test it on, you know, people. I train it using the data from people one and two, and test it on those from three and four, and then I, I train it on one and three, and test it on two and four, or what have you. And um, and there's some rules of thumb about, you know, the fractions that you train it on, say, two to three quarters of the data, and you test it on one quarter, but you rotate it around to make sure you're not privileging anything. And you use that to test the, the, the sort of generalizability of the models uh, in, in light of their ability to predict things in the testing subset. Yeah. So it sounds exactly like that. Um, and that's used for HMMs, but it's also used for most, most types of machine learning models do that sort of tra uh, that cross validation. Um, so that's supervised learning. Now in unsupervised learning, this is a situation where you might think it would be very hard to, to operate. So here, you don't have labeled observations. You don't have this sort of labeled data. But you, you still want to infer what's going on at a certain time. So here, what we're doing is we're inferring the HMM structure, we're inferring the values of the transition matrix, the values of the of the um, probability uh, transitions, to best explain the patterns uh, in the observed data. Now you may say, how could we do that? We don't know the true underlying situation. Yes, but what you're doing is you are asking what assumptions about the transition matrix and the probability distributions would make the observed data most likely to be generated by the model. Which ones would make it most plausible that we would see this sort of observations in the underlying data? And from that, you can actually infer these structures. Now, there's two ways in which these are done. Tina has just, just uh, been making great progress on a project which um, has helped bring, bring out these two different ways. One way is to try to directly deduce the values of this so-called transition matrix. Um, whoa, um, uh, there it is. Um, or in short, the values of these transitions, um, the, the probability of taking each transition per unit time, tries to deduce all of those from the data. But when we have more theory about the structure of what's going on, we know what states are plausibly connected with what other states. We can often do that job much better than we can by just directly estimating these what's using what's called the Baum-Welch algorithm. Baum-Welch will directly try to estimate these, but often we know more plausible information about what's likely. First, so for example, we may know that, um, for example, um, smoking, you're much more likely to, to transition to, from smoking to no use in a shorter period of time than for vaping. Or, so vaping tends to be, uh, tends to be engaged in for longer. Or, um, the, prop, the, the periods of smoking are normally not longer than, you know, uh, than half an hour at a time or what have you. And, and yet, it's, uh, it's a higher probability of, of going from there to, uh, to no use because of that than it is from um, going from no use to smoking. We may we have, may have some theory about the underlying situation about what's going on. In the case, for example, the model Tina's working with, we have very good theory about what's going on because we know how Ethica works. And, and, and so we can deduce some features of the situation 
some features of what's connected with what that allow us to optimize the transition matrix more effectively. So in unsupervised learning, what may seem to be a impossible task um, is in fact very readily possible. You're adjusting your assumptions about the model to best explain, to best, to make, uh, to create a model, to identify a model which has produces the observed data with the highest likelihood. And here you're, you're trying to find the, AP, the HMM, the assumptions about the HMM that will maximize the likelihood of observing the data or there's a, a, an algorithm known as entropy maximization, which uh, is also frequently used and is particularly valuable, for example, if you have missing data. Um, once you identify the HMM, you apply it to other data. And in that, in that regard, it's similar to, to supervised learning. So supervised learning gives us kind of a shortcut to estimate the HMM. Unsupervised learning allows us to estimate the ABM in a slightly more indirect way by asking what HMM is likely to yield data, the data that we see. But in both cases, once you have the ABM, you apply it to, to broader data. Um, and HMMs produced in this way can then be used to classify what's going on at a given period for a given person, regardless of, uh, you know, for a person whose data was not used to build the ABM, for example. Okay. Um, so these, these uh, the HMM, excuse me. Um, so for these HMMs, um, there's two primary algorithms that are used for the case of, of uh, both supervised and unsupervised learning. And they are known as the forward-backwards algorithm and the Viterbi algorithm. There's a further one known as Baum-Welch, which is particularly important for unsupervised learning if you're trying to estimate the transition matrix out of whole cloth. Trying to, trying to estimate it without a lot of theory going into it. Um, now, basically these algorithms allow for uh, computation of different quantities. And there's actually a third one, which I haven't named here, but it's basically computing the likelihood for this ABM. If I assume this ABM, what's, its likelihood, what's the likelihood I would have observed this data empirically that I, that I see? That's really important for the case of training an unsupervised HMM, one where we don't have labeled data. We want to max, we want to find an HMM that makes what we do observe the most likely. It would be most likely to have produced this data. But forward backward algorithm, once you have an HMM, you can then use forward backward algorithm to calculate the probability that that HMM is in a certain state at a given time, considering not just the data till now, but the data from forward times, which might constrain what's going on now. So maybe the data till now makes it quite ambiguous as to whether I'm driving or not. Maybe, um, maybe I haven't been in a vehicle uh, for some time, very likely. It's been consistently low rates of speed. And now I, I have one which is an ambiguous rate of speed. It's maybe five kilometers an hour. If I only consider the data till now, I may say, well, it's pretty low, low likely that I'm in, a, I'm in a vehicle. Pretty low likely that I'm driving. Because I've been observing all these low rates of speed, and now I'm observing one five kilometers an hour. It's probably just a fluke. But if I look going forward, and it's consistent, you know, 50 kilometers an hour, 100 kilometers an hour for the next hour, I might be more, much more likely to say, no, wait a minute, during that time, I was probably in a vehicle. I was just, you know, getting getting going in local streets before I got on the on the highway to Regina. And um, in that case, I'm much more likely to say, okay, I was probably driving them. So in short, your conclusions about the current situation might be informed not only by data till now, but data going forward from now, from from future times. It it sort of helps inform what's likely going on now. Or let's suppose we had an individual who we didn't know if they were, um, uh, they were engaged uh, in uh, opioid abuse. And until this point, 
we don't, you know, th there's, there's prescriptions going on for opioids for chronic pain, but, um, but there's no particular evidence of, of abuse till now. But if, you know, two weeks from now, there's an overdose call at that house, and um, in another week yet, you know, there's a report of, of theft of opioids from someone else in the family or something, we might be likely to say, okay, probably at this time, that person was in an opioid disordered state at this point in time. We just didn't know it from the data leading up to them, but the data in the future gives us that clue looking backwards as to what was going on with, with that hindsight that came. Generally speaking, um, we can apply these retrospective analyses uh, uh, when we have extra data that has, has come in to good effect. So the forward backwards algorithm allows us to say, right now, what's the probability we're in each state? Take into account all data forward and, and backwards. So what's the likelihood that we were in an outbreak at this time, given this HMM? So given that I deduce this HMM either from label data or more likely from, un, from unsupervised learning, um, we deduce this. We, we reply this retrospective and we say that week, kind of a, a, a middling level of data, what was the likelihood we were in a, an outbreak at that time? And, and this understanding would take into account data from subsequent weeks, data from earlier weeks, and take into account the HMM structure and, and say, okay, probably we were in, you know, with this, with this, uh, an outbreak, say we had a probability of 0.4 being in that and not non-outbreak probability of 0.6. That's what a forward backward algorithm would give. It would give the probability at that time that we were in each state. That probability might be very different from what we would judge if we only considered the data at that time. If we looked up 15 here, and we'd see, okay, for non-outbreak versus for outbreak, what's the probability for each one? Using just that data point, we might um, arrive at some conclusion, but it would be a lot less informed conclusion by look than by looking at this full set of data and considering how quickly we change states. Because after all here, if we're in a non-outbreak state, say with great confidence here, it suggests we're not so likely to be in an outbreak state the next week. It's only 30% chance. So we're not so likely to have transitioned to that. Does that make sense? So I want to emphasize this interpretation and the forward backward, uh, backward algorithm is taking into account, yes, other data, but also the, mar the structure of the hidden Markov model in terms of how quickly we change state. And if we know that we're changing state very infrequently and we have high confidence about what was going on the last state, it really helps us interpret what's going on now. So if last week or last month we were quite confident this person we're studying was disordered with respect to opioids, or was, uh, th then it, it might suggest a high likelihood this month that this disorder persists given absent treatment. Or similarly, if that person was highly exhibited high degrees of suicidal ideation last week, it might lend credence to what's going on this week. Similarly, if, if we knew that they exhibited a high level of suicidal ideation for the next week because we had some data point, it, it kind of whispers about what's going on this week once we consider how quickly the system changes. Does that make sense? Now that reasoning is going to carry us through particle filtering as well. That basic idea is not just the data, it's the underlying dynamics of the system that clue us in to what's going on. So forward backward algorithm basically allows us to estimate what the probability of being in each state at a given time in light of all the data and in light of model structure. Hmm? A very important constraint there with model structure. The model's changing state very infrequently and you know, you know that what the state was in 
either the previous time or later times, it really constrains what's, what was likely the case here. Okay. Um, so, so that's the forward backward algorithm. Now the specifics of it, um, I'd be welcome to go into, but I want to talk about the other algorithm first. There are standard R packages that will compute this and we'll be providing you code for those R packages, you could see how HMM work. There are also Python code packages um, that that you can make use of. So I want to I want to make sure the understanding is there rather than necessarily getting to all the details of the algorithms. Although I have provided some details of that. So the other algorithm of great significance beyond forward backward and beyond computing the likelihood is something called the Viterbi algorithm. Now the Viterbi algorithm is different than the forward-backward algorithm. The forward-backward algorithm will give us this probability that I'm in each state at a given time. So given this certain time here, what was the probability I was in the non outbreak state then and the outbreak state then? Maybe there's a 80% you know, chance I was in the outbreak state, a 20% chance I was in non outbreak that's pretty good. That's often what we're interested in, right? What was the probability they were driving just before the crash? They were driving with their, excuse me, they were driving um, and using their smartphone just before the crash. If we could deduce that, we might help infer causative factors, for example, that are relevant. But the Viterbi algorithm gives us something different. And it's also something of great interest. The Viterbi algorithm gives us not the probability we are in each state at, at a certain time, but the, gives us a record of the single most likely trajectory, the single most likely sequence over time. I would note for my students that this is linked to something that Xiao Yan has been working on and that Anahita has worked on on deducing trajectories in the particle filtering context. Because this is about estimating not just what's going on at one time, but what the single most likely sequence is over time. It's called the Viterbi algorithm. Okay? So we're going to take a look at these, um, uh, each of these algorithms a little bit. But the Viterbi algorithm is given in HMM and it estimates the single most likely sequence of events from start to finish that this person likely went through. So it would say, you know, in the first minute they were driving, 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 non-driving, maybe for 10 times, and then driving, 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 etc. Um, and I will note that for a single point in time, let's say at, at a certain time, the forward backward algorithm would say they have a very high likelihood of being driving. It could be that that's different from what is suggested by the Viterbi sequence, because the Viterbi sequence is dealing with sequences of, of actual uh, changes over time. And, and what's most likely at that point might not be part of a valid sequence that knits together all the different points. Okay. Um, so the, the common sequence might require you, uh, certain things before and after which, which make just assuming that we're in the state with the highest probability at this certain time implausible. Um, so uh, uh, with the Viterbi sequence, we're not getting an estimate for what we're doing right now with highest probability. Rather, what's the single most likely trajectory over time for what's happened. The single most likely story for what's gone on over time. And that might not always accord with the thing that we think is most likely at this certain time when we don't consider the need for the story about what happened before and what happened after. Okay. Um, the Viterbi algorithm, like the forwards backwards algorithm, are recommended by their ability to be computed very efficiently. The Viterbi algorithm makes use of something called dynamic programming, which, um, which basically provides a very efficient way of considering what uh, the most likely sequence is 
in a sort of way that builds it up out of, out of successive pieces. And um, it allows us to take a single most likely um, state from the very final time and work backwards from there to get a, a picture of what was likely the case in terms of the most likely sequence over time for the entire time period. It's a very efficient algorithm, one that can be run uh, for even longer sequences within seconds. The forward-backwards algorithm is, is uh, a two-pass algorithm. It runs forward uh, in a way over, over the data and then it runs backwards. It computes what are called forward probabilities and backwards probabilities. Um, and then it calculates the probability of being in a certain state at a certain time. Okay? Um, and it, it draws on its structure on the probability of being in a certain state at this time. Okay? Um, uh, so there's uh, a likelihood that we want to compute in computing the likelihood of observing some, of, uh, some empirical sequence of data given a certain HMM model structure. And uh, it turns out it's a straightforward sort of computation <coughs> once you write it down. I'd like to give you an intuition for this without going into all the mathematics by going through a little example, if we could. Is that okay? And you can see basically how these algorithms work, bearing in mind that it won't be too long till lunch is served. Okay? Um, so, um, we're going to assume a certain model structure here. And we are going to walk through some of the ways we can use this model structure to compute two things. One is the probability that at a given time, given just the data observed till now, we're in a certain state. So if we're, we have only data till now, what's the probability we're right now in an outbreak state, or right now driving? What's the probability right now we're sitting, giving only the data that we've seen till now? That's one thing it'll give clues of. The other thing it'll give clues of is the likelihood of observing the sequence given the structure of the HMM. And I'd remind you that for unsupervised learning, we don't have labeled data. We don't know the true situation at any time. And we're trying to find the model that will best accord with that data that has been observed, meaning it makes it most likely we would have observed the data. We don't want a model that posits that the data that's been observed is would be a fluke if we saw that. It would be completely implausible. We want a model that makes it very likely that we would have observed this data. And to compute that, we need to compute the likelihood of observing that data given the model. And the algorithm we'll be seeing um, is, a, is the, key, the key part of that. So here we have a model. We posit this model. And we may be positing different models and testing their consistency with the data by testing the likelihood they would have produced the data. Here's one model. Okay? It may not be predictive privilege. It may be one of hundreds or thousands that are examined. Okay? So here's this model. We're assuming these sorts of probabilities and, and uh, some probability, excuse me, these sorts of probability distributions. Given that you're in an outbreak state, this is the likelihood you've observed different number of incident cases. Given that you're in a non-outbreak state, this is the likelihood you would have observed a certain number of incident cases. And we want to know, okay, what's the, the probability of having observed some things? Well, we need one other piece of information, which is what do we guess is the starting distribution for this model? What's the probability we start in state A, that is the state of outbreak versus state B, the state of non-outbreak. Okay? And what's going to happen here is initially we're assuming 75% likelihood of being an outbreak uh, and 25% of being a non-outbreak. That was this probability here. Okay? This is outbreak, 75% chance, 25% chance of being in a non-outbreak, state B. Okay, that's our initial guess. And then we're gonna start to take in data. So there's an observation 
31. Now what I want to do is just walk through this, and I recognize this may not interest some of you, but for others it may provide the key insight for what's going on with these models mechanistically. So we're 75% likely to be in this state initially and 25% likely there. We're going to consider now, suppose now we have a transition going on, okay? Um, uh, so, so we're in that state initially, we have a transition and then we're going to have an observation, okay? Um, if we have a transition, well there's 75% chance we start in A and then we need to consider what's the probability in the next time unit, say next minute or next week, we'll be in state A, okay? Well, there's 75% chance we are in an outbreak state and if we if we want to consider what's the chance we're in an outbreak state the next time, you know, we need to consider, okay, what's the probability we're in an outbreak state and stayed there? That's this probability. So this is the probability we're, we're in an outbreak state initially. This is the probability we would have stayed there if we were in an outbreak state initially. But in addition to that, that's not the only thing we need to consider. That's not the only way where, where in time two we could be in an outbreak state. What's another way in time two we could be in an outbreak state rather than just staying in an outbreak state? We could also have started where? Non-outbreak and gone to an outbreak state. And that's what this probability is here, okay? And if you sum these up, this is the probability I started in an outbreak state and if I did, the conditional probability that I will stay in an outbreak state having started there. This is the probability that I started in a non-outbreak state. And this is the probability, having started an outbreak state, I go to an outbreak state. If you sum up these two multiplications, you get the total probability that in time step two, I'm in a, an outbreak state. I could have stayed there from earlier, or I could have gotten there having not been in an outbreak state originally, and now I am. And similarly, these are the probabilities that I'm in a non-outbreak state. I could have started a non-outbreak state and stayed there, or I could have started an outbreak state and gone to a non-outbreak state, right? So that, this one, the top element of the so-called vector gives the probability in step two that I'm in a, an outbreak state. And this one gives the probability in step two I'm in a non-outbreak state. And now, if we want to ask what's the likelihood here of observing the sequence given that we're in a certain state now, all we have to do is multiply that probability we're now in an outbreak state times the probability of observing from an outbreak state this value, this observed value 31. That's the probability of observing given that we're in an outbreak state this, this value is 31, and this is the probability of observing given we're in a non-outbreak state, the value is 31 from that distribution. And that gives us the probability of having observed that value and now being in, in an outbreak state and in a non-outbreak state. And then we need to transition, consider our transition again to the next state where we'll, we'll go to the next time unit and we'll have a certain probability of staying in an outbreak state or transitioning from an outbreak state to a non-outbreak state, et cetera, and that's what this is. And then we consider the probability of having observed the next little um, a bit of data. And this is gonna give us the probability of, of having observed this sequence um, and now being in this state, and being in an outbreak state and being in a non-outbreak state. The ratio of these two gives you actually, excuse me, the, the, the balance of these two, these are relative, these are, um, uh, the, the balance of these two will give you your probability of being in an outbreak state now versus a non-outbreak state. So if you were to consider how big this one is compared to that one, you can deduce that. And uh, secondly, uh, if you keep on applying this and you sum them up, it's gonna give you the likelihood of having observed this entire sequence of data um, uh, for across the model. If you sum it up across all states, we'll give you the, the likelihood of having observed that sequence of data for this model, for this HMM, okay? The key point here is that when we consider the probability 
of being in state A right now, we not only consider the, the likelihood of observing this from state A, the current data point, we consider what's the probability we were in a certain state the last time and the, and the probability we will have now transitioned to this state in this time. So in short, it takes into account not just when we're judging the probability of being in a certain state right now, it takes into account not just what's the observation right now, but what were, what were the probabilities of being in different states the last time, having taken into account all the data until then, and then the probability of transitioning from each of those states to this state right now, you know, of between those times. So in short, it's taking into account all this data earlier, and it's taking into account where we probably were this last time point, the probability of having met here or here, and it's taking into account, given where we were last time, the chance we would have gone to here. If we're considering the probability that we're here now, we're taking into account where we were last time, and then the probability of going from, from those places where we were last time to this time. So it's taking into account the data observed till now and the structure of the model. Again, take into account that if last time we were in a state which um, we were quite sure about, given all the observations till then, and if there's a very little probability going from that state to this one, we're very unlikely to be in this one now. Because it's very unlikely, if we were in this other state last time, it's very unlikely we would have reached this one now. Okay? That's the idea behind behind this algorithm. It takes into account the structure of the model, how likely it is you move from, the probability you move from one state to the other, in addition to the data considered till now. That's the intuition here. It's important because often each data point is ambiguous. From one data point alone, we can't deduce where we are now. We need to consider all the earlier data but we need to consider it in light of the fact that if it points to a certain thing having been the case last time unit, we need to consider where we are now in light of that in the model structure. If the model is saying we were almost certainly in a certain state last time, we have to consider how likely it is, if, if I want to consider being in a different state now, how likely it is I would have transitioned to here. Hmm? That's what the hidden Markov model does in computing this likelihood and in computing the, the balance of the chance of being in each state. So this computation, while it may have seemed forbidding, we could have continued it here, it's, it's one that is at the heart of computing where we likely are now based on data till this point, and it takes into account those key factors, which are also taken into account in particle filtering, which is the model dynamics, and the data till now. Now, the alpha-beta algorithm goes, excuse me, the forward-backward algorithm goes well beyond this. The forward-backward algorithm considers those factors, where I was last time, but also where I am probably next time. Um, and considers data not only up to this point, but in later times. If all we are is at time, at this time here, we don't have any time, we don't have data to any time after this latest point 15, we're not gonna be able to consider those later data points. And we have to just operate with those that we've seen, in which case this algorithm we've seen is, provides the, the key reasoning. But if we're at a later time point and we want to know retrospectively where were we then, we could take into account all the data after and before to deduce where we were at that time. And if we were very sure in the next time point where we were, we'll want to take that into account. If we were sure where we are in this time 26, that we were in an outbreak, we want to take that into account in affirming where we were at the time before it. Because it may be that it gives us great clues if we are next time in an outbreak that we may be in an outbreak this time. Okay, so that's the idea with the uh, with this uh, basic likelihood calculation. The alpha beta of uh, this forward backward algorithm gives us um, a way of building on this 
with some of the same basic mechanisms, but considering not just this, uh, this marching forward, but marching backwards as well from the later time points. The Turby algorithm, by contrast, gives us this way of deducing a sequence that's the single most likely sequence. So instead of telling us right now we were in an outbreak state at this time, which is useful that with this probability, non-outbreaks, this probability, an outbreak, what the perturbi algorithm would say is, for example, out, uh, non-outbreak, or sorry, outbreak, non-outbreak, 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 outbreak, outbreak, it would tell us the single most likely sequence over that entire time, which is often of real interest. Okay. HMMs. I don't expect you to, to have a good intuition for all of the mathematics here, but you should realize that it's very useful to take into account a few features of HMMs. Number one, this separation between a latent state, which you cannot directly observe, and the observations you happen to be getting. The observations are merely ambiguous whispers about the underlying state. And to deduce the underlying state, which is what all of system science is, much, is about, the underlying process, we need to take into account not just each observation as a solitude, as a single value, but many observations and the structure of the posited structure of a model. We need to try to arrive at a model that's most consistent with the evidence that we see. Given such a model, we can then address many sorts of questions. We can address, for example, what are the, how likely are different transitions between different states? We can deduce how likely it is someone will start vaping immediately after ceasing smoking. Um, how frequently do people vape versus smoke? We could ask how much time do they spend vaping versus smoking? How much time do they spend driving versus not driving for a given person? We could ask at a given time, such as just before an accident, um, uh, for example, was uh, someone engaged in a certain behavior? Um, and we could, we could do that in light of evidence till now for the current situation or retrospectively look back. And we can ask what's the most likely sequence of states that have transpired till now in light of, of all the data. And do so in a way that is savvy to the fact that we know a lot about model structure that constrains our interpretation of the data. The data is valuable here. There's no question this data is valuable. But there's something beyond the data we know, which is the form of the model. And if we can deduce consistent picture of these transitions, it will constrain our interpretation for what's likely going on over time. Okay. So that's what are one of the key things that HMMs bring to the table. HMMs are applied at all different levels. Um, they could be applied for classifying whether we're in an outbreak or not at a, at a level of a restaurant or at the level of a city. One of the students, Aiden Tehui, is, is, is doing that as part of his master's thesis. Alternatively, we might apply these at the level of a person to know is this person sitting or standing, or indeed, is the phone off my person or on it. We might use this to deduce, as Tina is, whether the phone at a given time has its screen on or off. Ethica doesn't record that. Ethica records when the screen turns on and when the screen turns off. But those measurements need to be taken to take into account that sometimes, for example, a phone is turned off or Ethica might be evicted from memory because the user is using another large program which kicks that out of memory for a couple minutes at a time. And so to deduce the underlying screen state, we want a way of inferring. Hidden markup models play this key role of allowing us to go from merely the aroma suggested by the data 
to the true underlying situation in the form of nutritious food. It's okay? lunchtime. So <laughs> it's lunchtime. Thank you very much. Before everybody runs away, just know that the soup today is a potato leek soup. While it's gluten free, it's not here. Okay? Just so you guys know. And otherwise,